Whenever the Prophet ﷺ would go to war, he would uh, wear a black turban. So we are engaged in war with coronavirus. So I thought, why not you know, <laughs> engage in war with corona by talking about Qur'an, about our Qur'an. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it beneficial. Ameen. So barakallah fikum. As we have mentioned before, yani the journey through the Qur'an is supposed to be a transformative one. And the Qur'an, if the Qur'an can't help you, between brackets, to become a better Muslim, a stronger Muslim, then nothing will. This is the first thing we need to know. Like if the Qur'an is not sufficiently strong enough for you, and its message not inspiring your soul, then that means that nothing will help you. And this is why a lot of people, they, they can't differentiate between that which your soul experiences and feels and that which your mind feels and experiences. And this is why some people, they, they accuse themselves of being dead spiritually. They say, whenever I hear an ashid, it moves me. It doesn't move your soul. It moves your mind, it moves your emotions. The soul is moved by the Qur'an when spoken to. Yani the soul when spoken to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the language which souls understand. It is far beyond the perception of the mind alone. And this is why many a non-Muslim back in the time of the Prophet wasallam would embrace Islam merely because of hearing the Qur'an. And now you see that these people who were fighting the Messenger of Allah والسلام, heard the Qur'an, were inspired and embraced Islam. And what is strange to see is that many Muslims are exposed to the Qur'an day and night, but it doesn't seem to change them. So what was going on? What was the reason behind the Arabs back in the time of the Prophet وسلم, like Umar ibn Khattab anhu, on his way to kill the Messenger of Allah like, decided, I will kill the messenger of God. And the moment he was walking and saw his sister, you know the story, I'm not talking about Sirah today. Then he just read, Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li tashqa illa tathkiratan li man yakhsha. And so forth. And when he read this, he said, I'm a Muslim. Done. Like, what happened between wanting to kill him and being a Muslim was nothing more than a couple of verses he heard. Meaning that if we were to understand the Qur'an in the way that they understood the Qur'an, it would change, it, change us every time we read it. But this is not what is going on. And I'm talking about my weak self and people like myself, maybe in your life, every time you read an ayah, you, you, you're better than right before you read it. But that's not the case with the majority of people. So the only way to read the Qur'an in such a way that it will transform us is by going back to a correct understanding, or rather, that we are going to try to find out what the true meanings, trans transformative messages between the, uh, behind the ayat, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us. Does that make sense? So now, barakallahu feekum, what we need to know is we have to look at this ayat, and we are also going to look between the tanasub bain al-ayat, what does that mean? How are these ayat connected to one another? Because very often we read a certain passage from the Qur'an and then all of a sudden it speaks about something else. And then I say, I can't see the relevance. Like I know there should be one. But what is, how can it all of a sudden go from Yawm Al-Qiyamah to Hal Ataka Hadith Musa? Like what's going on? Yani first it was about the, the angels, it was about Qiyamah. And now all of a sudden it's about Musa. So the reason why is actually very obvious and clear. It is Fir'aun, yani you should know that these verses were revealed in a time where the mushrikun were very, yani very severe and harsh. They were torturing Muslims, abusing women, they were uh, yani killing them. And people looking at Quraysh, yani whenever you have an oppressor, no matter how tiny his empire may be, you will always consider him to be big and that it is impossible for you to change some, something to the landscape you are living in at that particular moment. Meaning, you look at something, somebody with authority torturing you, um, killing you, 
persecuting you and you live in exile, you say, this is never going to stop. Because on the one hand, the Prophet ﷺ is not giving the authority by Allah to defend himself physically. He would pass the companions and would say things like, Sabran al yasir fa inna mawidakum al jannah. Be patient, O al yasir, because paradise has been promised. So just be patient. So they would look at it and say, No way. All these people of Quraysh with their horses and with their, with their swords and, and with their authority and all the tribes of the non Muslims would join Quraysh immediately just to what? Just to kill the Muslims. So the feeling was quite, yani, so it was quite challenging. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling and talking in a nazi'ati gharqa, nashitati nashta, what the end in the afterlife will be for the one who believes and for the one who persecutes them because it was about Quraysh. So now they say, okay, that's in the afterlife. So at least we have peace of mind that when we die, there will be nazi'ati gharqa, nashitati nashta. But on the other hand, they say, what about this life? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, didn't the story of Musa reach you? If you think that Quraysh has an authority and strength and power, then look at the power and the empire of, of Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him to an end. Allah took his empire, he destroyed that empire, which is far more difficult from a human perspective to get rid of. So if Allah took away Fir'aun, do you really doubt that Allah will take away some Bedouins with a tent and a horse in the middle of the desert? So this is to inspire the people whenever they live under the authority of, a, of an oppressor. Sometimes even now when we look, and I'm not, I'm not specifying anything, but the global landscape, political landscape for today, is one where people are very often oppressed. Where people, orphans are not being taken care of. Where people spend more on a football player than on a baby in need of milk. That, that's the world we live in for the moment. And we just don't know how to change it. We look at it. And our hearts cry, not only over the Muslims who are oppressed, but also over the non-Muslims. Like there is oppression and injustice all around the world. So now you say this image that I have of the world now with internet and with global politics and the, the what and all the world turning into one small village, I will never be able to change it. It became too powerful. We say no. Didn't the message of Musa reach you? So it is in the hereafter, but there is no empire, no empire which has existed, which still exists today. And exactly like we will reach the climax of our existence and either maybe be destroyed by our way of life, by our expectations of life, or because whatever, we will be destroyed and other people will come. So these are the days Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we alter between people. One day is in your favor, one day isn't. But when you're a mu'min, every landscape you live in is in your favor, even if you're oppressed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not be weakened and don't be sad because you have the upper hand. That is if you are believers. That's in this life and also in the hereafter. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ فَوْقَهُمْ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ And the people with taqwa will be above them on the day of judgment. So having the upper hand is the eternal upper hand and not the temporarily one. And this is why we should know that there are some things happening now in life which are far beyond our pay grade. We, we can't change that, like on a global level. So this is why we need to return. A landscape we have today is no more than thoughts and plans of people of the past. They planned, individuals executed these plans, and this is the way that the world was shaped. So if we now plan, and not planning like fighting and this and that. I'm talking about creating a better world for everybody, then we can do that. If we now, more than 1 billion 700 million Muslims, all start merely by educating their children on a spiritual level, on a religious level, on a scientific level, on whatever, social level, financial level, then they will shape the future. So now it is... A, 
how much do we want to change that? Because we always look at ourselves. We can't change it, not at a global level, but we can at an individual one. We can pass it on to our children. We can pass it on to our neighbors. We can pass it on to our community. Well, the khutaba on the mimbar should prepare people for that, for that positive, positive thing. The, the, the asati, that, the teachers, the professors, uh, people, the, yeah, everybody sharing the same message. And then that view which you have of your ideal world, wallahi, can be created within 40 years. Within 40 years. The world can change merely by changing the new generation, by educating them, by, by their upbringing. If you just look at how far people plan towards the future, do you really think that BMW only found out in 2020 that they want a new design for their X, uh, X, uh, sorry, it's not the X7, for, uh, sorry, uh, X6? Do you really think it's only now? Oh, let us think. They already have what they want in 2022, 2025, 2030. But they give it gradually so that you would keep on buying. They're not going to give the, what, the future shape of the car of 2030 because then you will not, you see. But this is also what Muslims used to do. If you just look at Muhammad al-Fatih, yani Muhammad al-Fatih, yani he had a dream which was inspired by his father. Now, he became that great grand leader when he was still very young. And, and his father, yeah, and he stepped back and then he told his son, now you are the leader. And then when they were attacked by the crusaders, then uh, he called his father. And his father said, I'm no longer the king. Because he told his father, come and join us because you have the strategy to defeat them. Then his father answered, no. And he said, look, father, either I am your king and I command you to come. Or either you are the king and you are obliged to come. One of both. So his father came. But then uh, Muhammad al-Fatih, yani, he had that dream of Qustantiniya, Istanbul, the town of Islam, Istanbul. And one of the things he did was when he was only 17, he would go there and he would bribe between brackets, preachers, now priests, in the churches. And he would say, look, and that's years and years before realizing his dream. He would give them a lot of money. And he would say, if one, tell the people at the end of each sermon that whenever the day comes that boats will sail, not on water, but on mountains, no, that they will be defeated. So the priests, well, that's easy money. <laughs> So, okay, after every sermon, there I go. Yes, and know that whenever, whatever, any mountains will sail over the, uh, ships will sail over the mountains, then we are defeated. So the priests didn't really know what it meant. But Constantinia was surrounded on the one hand by water and on the other by mountains. It was impossible. And there where the water was, there was a very big chain which would not allow the, what, the, the ships to cross. So they would be stopped here, and if they were enemies, they would be, yani they would what? fire uh, these, uh, these arrows and, and, and what do you call catapults and they would just burn the ships. So now Muhammad al-Fadi had a dream. He said, I need this. Because the Prophet spoke about it, that the best leader with the best soldiers and the best ones who've ever sat on a horse will be the ones who, what? who will conquer Constantinia. So now he, he said this and then when he went, he went with his army masked as traders, disguised as just merchants. So they passed around the mountains like this. So when the soldiers looking, they had nothing, no weapons. And even if they had weapons, so what? But they didn't. So they said, no, it's, it's only merchants. So they set up their camp there and they started making these cannons. Nam, they would sculpture it from the mountains and there and then they would build their cannons. And we say cannons, right? Nam, uh, so in order to attack them and then they chopped a lot of trees, they cut it into pieces, made a kind of rail out of it, so that now they would drag their boats with oxes and so forth, they would just drag it over the mountains. And when now the soldiers who would also attend the sermon, saw boats, but because they didn't see, they, 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 it was far away, and they say, saw boats with sails passing the mountains, they dropped their weapons. Because they said, this is what the priest told us. This is a battle we can't win. 
This was a young man who had a dream that it took him years. The problem is we always look for short-term goals because that's easier upon our soul. It is easier upon our mind because it just, you know, we are used, especially today, you a click of the mouse and there you are, you get what you want. I want a new book, Amazon. I want this, Amazon. I, everything I want, I can. I even don't need to leave my house to go shopping. I don't need to leave my house to attend classes, like tomorrow, online, there we go. So we got so used to getting things so quickly and easily that we only go for short-term goals. The problem with a short-term goal is that it gives immediate satisfaction but it doesn't, it doesn't change the landscape. It doesn't change the world. What we need now is people who say, I want to be a part of the goal, and I understand I am not the goal. No? I want to be, be a part to the solution. I am not the solution. Nobody's the solution. This is why we are a community. So if we now have that long-term view, then the Musa amongst us, I mean, never, of course, meaning leveling the Prophet and Musa alayhi salam, but will then be whom? Will be then those who got rid of oppression around the world, without regards to this oppression being from a Muslim or non-Muslim. And without regards to removing it from a Muslim or a non-Muslim. We are people of the world. We want good for everybody. So now, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى So all you people who are so desperately looking at the world, don't you think that it went through the mind of Musa alayhi salam when he looked at the empire of, of Fir'aun, that he said, how am I in Allah's name going to change this? He came with his brother and a stick. That was it. His brother and a stick. That was it. And you, you shouldn't think that Fir'aun was like, his empire was just because it was old, that there was no, no, what, no structure. No, they were ministers, governors. They would be thinking, they would be sharing their ideas. So it was just like today. Like you would go now to uh, house number 10, is it that, whatever. And you go with your stick and your brother. You say, well, I have something to say. People will not listen to you. Maybe you will, they will take you to, to psychiatry. But So... Here, Barakallahu Fikum, we need to understand this. That when Musa was sent to the empire of, of Fir'aun, that wasn't an easy thing to do. And he said, Ya Rabbi, I'm afraid that he will harm us. And Allah said, Idhaba ila Fir'aun. He said, La takhafa, don't be afraid. Innani ma'akuma, asma'u wa ara. Allah told him, Musa and Harun, two men, thousands of soldiers. Horses, swords, spears, prisons, dungeons. So he said, Do not be afraid. Because definitely I am with you. I hear and I see. So <laughs> this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this verse is so confronting. This verse is so actual. Like, please. Don't look at the world through your weakness, but look at the world through Allah's strength. This is what the verse is telling us. Don't look at the world through your weakness. Look at the world through Allah's strength. And when you know that Allah is in charge of the world, and that He's the King of Kings, He's the leader of masters, He is the leader of all, yani He is the Lord of all, then you know that nothing is happening in this world without Him wanting so. To test us. Are we going with the flow? Or are we individually going resist negativity and negative vibes in my own life without harming others, without trespassing the law? Am, am I going to live up to my deen? So, Hal Ataka Hadith Musa, according to Imam al Razi, the hell here, uh, hell, <laughs> the hell here doesn't mean like, has uh, there reached you the story of Musa? Uh, some of the Mufassirun, they say the hell means laqad. Yani laqad ataka hadithu Musa. Not hell. Not the question. Because Musa was mentioned, he was known. And yani, another way of saying, if we were to say that it's a question, is like, didn't I tell you? Or didn't you listen? Not to the Prophet, I saw somebody in general. Like, did, didn't you hear me saying this last time? You will say, yes, I did. It's not a question. It's a rhetorical question. Yeah? It's a rhetorical question. Didn't the story of Musa reach you? Don't be afraid. These people, these Bedouins, are nothing. 
compared to Musa. Now, it's compared to Fir'aun. Now, what the beautiful thing here is, Barakallahu Fikum, is in the story of Musa and Fir'aun, is that at the very beginning, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالنَّازِعَةِ غَرْقَى وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى We said نَاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى, that the word نَشَطَى is used for a bucket you pull out of, the, uh, out of a well. You're not going to widely do that. You are going to take that very gently because you don't want to lose any water. So that is the way we said that the soul of the people will be taken gently, of the believers. Then we said غرقى are those who drown in pain. So نَازِعَاتِ غرقى وَنَاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى نَاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gently took Musa and his people away from Fir'aun. Not with fighting. There was no fight. Not with rebellion. It was just, we leave. We leave. There we go. And then Fir'aun said, no, you shouldn't leave. And he follows them. So Musa, if he were to come and say, like, speak very harshly, he would have been killed. He would have been killed. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرْ أَوْ يَخْشَى Allah said, O Musa and Harun, يعني, قُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا يعني, Speak gently to him. لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرْ أَوْ يَخْشَى So that he will receive admonishment or that he will يعني, be reminded and what to use his mind. So they didn't come just like, no, they, they came. Because it's a leader, don't forget. It was a leader. Like today, you're not going to be harsh with a leader if you want to change something. You're going to talk with wisdom. So now they went. So on the one hand, Musa was taken away gently. And Fir'aun was literally drowned. The ones that take away the soul while others drown. In what? In pain? Or literally in pain and water. So now you see how Nazi'ati Gharqa, Nashitati Nashta is once again connected to the further story. Like the introduction to the story. Remember how we started, then we went to the middle, and then we went back again. And now we can skip these two passages again and independently uh, lose from that which is between Nazi'ati Gharqa, which is the Qiyamah. And this we can understand this again. Hal ataka hadithu Musa. إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ تُوَى When his Lord called him into the sacred valley of Tuwa, how did he call him? Well, through an intermediate. Yani it was Musa seeing what? Seeing the fire. He, Musa saw the fire. إِذْ قَالِ لِأَهْلِهِمْ كُثُوا إِنِّي أَنَسْتُ نَارًا When he told his family, remain all of you here, because verily I have seen a what? I have seen a fire. Subhanallah, the, the story of Musa and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him is very similar to our story with prayer. Is very similar to our story with prayer. The first thing you see here is that Allah called him. He wasn't looking for Allah. Allah, figuratively speaking, was looking for him. Allah doesn't look for anything, right? So that's why I said figur figuratively speaking. Like, he, he was not calling upon Allah, Allah was calling him. And that's the same thing if we were to live in a country with the Adhan, you are indulged into your worldly affairs, not even thinking about Allah or bothering about the hereafter. And all of a sudden you hear, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. There you are, Allah is calling you. So this is one of these divine gifts, is that you are being called to prayer. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu idha nudiya li salati. Um, o believers, whenever you are called to the Salah of Jum'ah, so you are being called. So here, maybe we are not being called like Musa, but we are being called. Every time. Every time the sustainer of the world is calling us to meet him five times a day. Um, so then Musa, السلام, when he went, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately spoke to him. إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكَ فَخْلَعَنَا عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى Now, Musa, verily, I am your Lord, he heard. Remove your shoes, because you are in the valley of Tuwa. So now Musa is being spoken to directly. And this is why we call Musa Kalimullah, the one whom Allah has spoken to. Like the Sha'ir said, the Nazim, 
وكلم الله موسى عبده تكليما ولم يزل بخلقه عليما so musa was spoken to now when this was happening yani ikhla'na alayka innaka bil wadi al muqaddas tuwa so that means that before talking to allah when you are called by allah there is something we call a tahliya and a takhliya a takhliya and tukhliya yani that you leave everything which is impure or everything which is not needed in prayer so that's the first thing allah says look you are in wad al muqaddas tuwa it's a sacred valley so take off your shoes and this is what we do when we come into the mosque we're in the sacred valley of prayer and so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to speak we need to know that because this is what allah was telling him right this innani ana allah la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqimi salata li dhikri la ilaha illa ana fa'budni so worship me wa aqimi salata li dhikri and establish prayer in order to commemorate me so the reasons why or there's one reason why Allah mentioned that we should pray which is dhikruhu which is to do dhikr of him and this is why the scholars say prayer is no more than doing dhikr in the light of the ayah alladhina yadhkuruna Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim yani that you commemorate Allah in all of your possible situations standing up bowing down sitting and sujood so that you would with your body do dhikr of Allah in all these positions standing up bowing down sitting in between two sujoods or tashahud and in sujood wa aqimi salata li dhikri so salah has only been obli- made obligatory so that we would do dhikr of Allah jalla wa ala so this is the discussion which is, or this is rather what is going on there so uh, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ uh, So and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, tells more. He says, فَعْبُدْنِي وَأَقِمِي الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي إِنَّ السَّاعَةَ آتِيَةٌ أَكَادُ أُخْفِيهَا لِتُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا تَسْعَى So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the hour will take place and that everybody will be rewarded or punishment in line with what he or she did. So what do we take away from all of this? One, clean yourself before prayer, inwardly and outwardly. Then secondly, you pray to do dhikr and you pray to prepare, prepare yourself for death. For the time that everybody yani, uh, will be standing in front of Allah Jalla wa'ala. And now, and, and I'm, it's not a, a class about prayer, but this is what is being said here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, and what is there in your right hand, O Musa? وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى He said, قَالَ هِيَ عَصَايَا تَوَكُوا عَلَيْهَا وَغُشُّ بِهَا عَلَى غَنَمِي وَلَيَا فِيهَا مَا عَلِبُ أُخْرَى I yani do many things with my stick. It is, yani, I bring down the leaves for my, for my sheep to eat from. I walk with it and I do many other things with it. So the scholar said, This is the sweetness of talking to Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He only asked him, What is it? And the answer to what is not the same answer as to what. Uh, what do you do with it? So his answer should have been, not should have been, and he should have been from a logical point of view. What is it in your right hand, Musa? A stick. But he didn't mention what it was, but rather what he did with it, because that's longer. So meaning that whenever you are in prayer, you like to, uh, to, to prolong that prayer, because it is a two-way communication. It's a two-way communication. So this is what we take away from it. Now, he, it's this and it's that and it's such and it's such. And he kept on going. Like some of us say, وَلِيَا فِيهَا مَا أَرِبُ أُخْرَى was a way of Allah saying that he kept on going, saying everything he do, does with his stick. And I have other things. Meaning, and I do this, Ya Rabbi, and that. With, why? Because he's talking and Allah is listening to him. Right? So this is where people take away that in prayer, it's all about a two-way communication. It's not a one-way communication. It's not you talking to Allah. It's Allah calling you, talking to you, and you are responding. Okay? So anyway, when this went on, he saw the miracles and so much more. And then, yani, he said, go to Fir'aun. Innahu taha. Yani, because he has transgressed. Now you see the feeling of Musa alayhi salam. Yani, like Fir'aun is a transgressor. He will most likely kill you if you try to give him some nasiha. So this is why he said, Rabbi sharah li sadri. Expand my chest. Yani, Give me courage and perseverance 
and patience and wisdom, which he already had, but even more. وَيَسِرْ لِي أَمْرِي And make it easy for me. وَحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي And detach the knots which are in my tongue, meaning make me as eloquent as possible in order to invite towards the deen. نعم. وَجَعَلْ لِي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي And give me a help, a comfort, a companion from my family. What they say here is that there is no one you can trust as much as your family. That was back in the days they used to say this. Now they say family is no longer defined by bloodlines. It's defined by the deen. Your brother, your best brother is the one who helps you on your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one you can count on when you are in need of him. Many brothers and many sisters, you blood sisters, you might not you know, be able to rely on as much as people with taqwa. So let's continue. So he says, وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِ هَارُونَ أَخِي And he make it Harun, my brother. And in another one, he says, because he's more eloquent than me. هَارُونَ أَخِي أُشْدُدْ بِهِ أَزْرِي وَأَشْرِكْهُ فِي أَمْرِي And so he says, so that he can help me and so forth. So this is what is going on. So immediately when Musa is being told that he has to go to Fir'aun, there is no resistance. There is no like, he just says, Ya Rabbi, what should I do? They are strong. And Allah says, لَا تَخَافَ إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمْ I am with you. Meaning that here, when you are trying to change the world for the better, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. He will not leave you. Not meaning that you won't go through trouble, that you won't go through afflictions, that you will not be tested in your honor, or in your family, in your wealth, in your health, in everything. But one thing you will never lose is that Allah is with you. And this is why people who lose everything, but yet know that Allah is with them, have the feeling that they can carry on. So this is why when you are afflicted, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالذُّنُوبِ This is why whenever you are afflicted, watch out for sinning. Because in sinning in the midst of affliction takes away your very motivation to carry on. Some people say, Allah says that no burden is too heavy to carry. That's true. If you carry it with Iman. Not when you carry it with your Aqal. Because when you look at affliction through, or through your Aqal, then very often you will not even see the wisdom behind your test. You say, why? This is not possible. So many planes taking off to bombard innocent people. Killing them. Soldier taking off, coming back to his family, no problem, or even from a container somewhere in, a, in the desert with a remote control. So you say, why are so many planes taking off who damage so many lives? And my mother, my father, just went to Hajj and, there, and I lost them. Why? What is going on? Through the aql you don't understand. So a test will not be too heavy to carry if you carry the test with your soul. And that is where we carry it. And that is where the strength of the mu'min is. That is where he, when his body just fell down on the floor, when he is sitting on his knees desperately, waiting for something to happen, then all of a sudden his soul is survived. And that soul picks up his own body and says, there you go. You are with Allah. And people looking at him or her said, that person should have been done with long time ago. Allah is eternal and His help is eternal. So when we carry tests with our soul, we will overcome everything. But when we sin in times of affliction, we will become desperate, depressed, unhappy, heavy, and we will not find a way out. Because then we will end up like everybody else who doesn't have a belief in Allah. Then it just became something physical. Do you see that? So هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى So Musa a.s. is making very clear that it's, it's all about remaining strong spiritually because what he says after saying Ya Allah, let Harun help me كَيْ نُسَبِّحَكَ كَثِيرًا وَنَذْكُرَكَ كَثِيرًا إِنَّكَ كُنْتَ بِنَا بَصِيرًا قَالَ قَدْ أُتِيتَ سُؤْلَكَ يَا مُوسَى SubhanAllah And here he says Ya Rabbi, so that we can يعني, do a lot of dhikr of you a lot of tasbih of you. نَذْكُرَكَ كَثِيرًا إِنَّكَ كُنْتَ بِنَا بَصِيرًا So he says, why do I want Harun next to me? 
is because we want to do a lot of dhikr. Why? Because dhikr has the most unimaginable powers within it. Dhikr, when you are in front of an enemy. Dhikr, when you are in front of your examinator. Dhikr, when you are in front of a problem which needs to be solved, will open all the doors for you. So when we want to change things in life, we want to do a, change our souls, uh, or rather our, ourselves, then we need to have a lot of dhikr going on. No? So and that's why very often we don't succeed. We can't carry on. This is why we give up. Because there is no dhikr. And why dhikr? Look at this. Allah said, I am with you. But Musa knows that Allah is with you more when you do dhikr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يعني, أَنَا مَا عَبْدِي مَا تَحَرَّكَتْ بِي شَفَتَاهُ I am with my servant for as long as his lips move to, do, to commemorate me. So now he says, Ya Rabbi, yani we will do a lot of dhikr of you so that you are with us at all times. And then because Musa only asked things on behalf of the deen, you don't see that he was asking, Ya Rabbi, and because now I am inviting towards religion, I want the best horse, the best camel, I want the best clothes, I want the best of everything, I want an entire troop following me, raising the flags and the weapons. He didn't say that. He was just asking, Ya Rabbi, allow me to do dhikr of you with my brother. <laughs> Subhanallah. Look at this. He's being sent to Fir'aun. Ya Rabbi, please, my brother, dhikr. <laughs> so where is his mind? So, Yani, it's here. So this is where they then went. And because he asked solely for that, which is of a religious benefit and of benefit to the community, Allah says, لَقَدْ أُتِيْتَ سُؤْلَكَ يَا مُوسَى you have been given what you have asked for, Ya Musa. Meaning that when you ask things for the sake of Allah, not for your own sake, Allah will give it. You see? So this is what we take away. And so when Allah says, Hal ataka hadithu Musa, it's not just like Musa went to Fir'aun, he spoke to Fir'aun, nine miracles, Fir'aun didn't believe, went back to the sea, Fir'aun drowned. That's not what Allah Jalla wa These are outwardly the things which are happening. This is the chronological order of what happened, but it's not the meaning which it contains. So we need to look, in order to understand the book, at all of these things. So now all of a sudden, these people, together with the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet definitely was telling them about Musa. He was sharing these stories. So these people now felt encouraged. They said, even if we are living now, we live in exile in the outskirts of Mecca. So what? So what? Even if they kill us and they harm us and torture us, so what? Eventually, things will change. And that is also how we should feel. Because when I look at Muslims today, too often they speak out of their weakness of faith. Weakening other people, weakening other believer, believers. This is the end of the world. What do you know? We are almost there. Maybe we are, maybe we are not. And we just don't care. Because if you die today, it doesn't matter when the end of the world will, will be. So they are so weak that they say, no, it will never change. It is impossible now. Look, we are oppressed everywhere. Look, only evil people are rich, which is not true. There are good people who are rich as well. Only the evil people are rich. People who have life reality TV shows are the rich people. And here I am with my iman living in a house with one room and look at people. Yani not being of any benefit to people living in palaces with 11 bathrooms and 95, <laughs> 95 I don't know what rooms. Don't look at that. Because when you share that with the people, you are the very cause why they will lose their trust in Allah. I believe that we can change the world. I truly believe this. That's not like a Tony Robbins, Anthony Robbins uh, motivational coaching, life coaching speech which I'm giving. It is rather something based on the Kitab and the Sunnah. It is, you know, there are so many things yet to happen which didn't happen. That the Prophet ﷺ said, every house, Islam will enter into every house. This hasn't happened yet. Islam will enter into every house. It hasn't happened. So many things. So if we are going to look about Allah Fikum, never be the reason or never be the serum which is injected into the veins of the souls of people ending up in a spiritual disease. Don't be the disease of the Muslim community. Don't be that. Prophet ﷺ said, speak good or keep your mouth shut. Either you speak good or either you remain silent. There is no in-between. And in light of this, 
we should live. In life of this, we should feel and look to the, towards the future. This is who we are. That is what we stand for. We have Allah speaking to us. He says, O oh, you who doubt me? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Who you think, he who thinks that changing the world is impossible, that the world will only become worse, that there is no end to your problem, that there is no end to the suffering of the ummah. هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى It's a very strong verse. Just that question, should, we, just, we should just sit down and ponder, meditate and reflect. And then you will see. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَىٰ إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَىٰ And then we go to the next one. So sometimes you will find the story in detail. And some, sometimes in other chapters you will find it with a lot of, uh, sometimes with a lot of detail and sometimes very concise and short. No? And that's because of the importance of the story. So now Allah says, اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَىٰ فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّىٰ وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَىٰ So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Now, this is the detail of what Allah was mentioning in Surah Taha, where he says, yani, tell him sweet words, kind words. That's this here. Go to Fir'aun. Indeed, he has transgressed. And faqul, and tell him, would you be willing? Would you be willing, oh you who claims to be God? Would you be willing, he who transgresses and oppresses people day and night, who kills all the new bones? Would you? And now when a Muslim is a sinner, we, we destroy his everything by talking ill of that person. This is Fir'aun. Would you be willing? And then when you see, you say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Astaghfirullah, I don't know what's going on. And then that indirect gossip, I hate that. When a sister passes by or a brother and they are not dressed according to the teachings of Islam, then without referring to that sister, Astaghfirullah, sister, today, today don't dress like before. What, what are you saying? You are, you're, you're just gossiping. Indirectly. Everybody knows what you are referring to. Huh? So this is why, Barakallahu Fikum, like people have more mercy, and they should. Mercy and politeness and ethic, uh, and, and et, uh, ethi, no, any politeness towards non-Muslims than they have towards their own Muslim brethren. Like when it's in, with a Muslim, if I'm not on time, it's okay. But when it's with Muslims, I know that I, non-Muslims, I have to be on time. With Muslims, if I'm late, it's okay. He's a Muslim. Now, so this, if you look at this, this is the biggest tyrant on the world ever. Hell, leka, ila an tazakka. Would you like, Firaun, please? It's better for you. <laughs> That's the way, right? So and look at how we talk about Muslims, even on Facebook, how people just kill each other and destroy each other. These keyboard warriors, like, like shooting all these words at you, killing the very core of your essence and your being and your honor. This is Fir'aun. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّىٰ Would you like to purify yourself? وَأَهْدِيَكْ Would you like me to guide you? إِلَىٰ <laughs> رَبِّكْ Not towards me, towards your Lord. And this is so dangerous to say. Because you will see that Fir'aun says, Ana rabbukumul a'la. I am your most elevated Lord. So this here is the most difficult thing to say to Fir'aun. Because they would believe that Pharaoh was kind of manifestation of God in the flesh. No? He was the God on earth. He was a goddess. Uh, he was a god, sorry. And goddess as well. So, فَقُلْهَا لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّىٰ وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ So that's a dangerous one. Huh? So uh, he would say, I'm, I'm your Lord, not you, nobody else. Fatakhsha, And so that you would fear him. Because fearing, look, what you need to know, Tagha, transgressed. We are all transgressors. Some a lot, some not as much, and some almost not. But transgressing is going against the haq. Transgressing is going against the truth. And sinning is transgressing. So now when you look here, the way to get rid of transgressing, and this is now for Muslims, and now you can say, yeah, but it's about Fir'aun, so what, what, what is the link to Muslims? Imam Al-Qurtubi said in his muqaddima that all the verses which are related to the non-Muslims and describing their diseases also relates to the Muslim 
but not in the meaning of kufr, but in the meaning of behavior. Okay? So here he says, So when you see that you transgress, that you sin, or that you don't do, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the things that you should be obeying Him, then one, purify yourself. Like when all of a sudden you stop doing what you have to do, or you start doing things which you shouldn't do, then most likely it's because of a certain sin. That sin can be outward and inward. Yeah, it can be your heart, your mind, whatever. Social interaction. And that pushes you. So the first thing you need to do is taskiyah. Purify yourself if you want to get rid of transgression. Purify yourself from your surroundings if you see that you're surrounded by the wrong people. Or that you are attached to your screen on your telephone or your PC. Being exposed always to people which make no sense. And then you ask Allah his hidayah. And that will then eventually read, uh, lead to khashya. Khashya meaning the opposite of taha. Taha means being above something. And khashya means something which is flat. Like the flat earth, al-khushu'a, al-khashya, nam, and so forth. Means like flat lined. So taha means going like this, trespassing. And the khashya is submitting. So when we do teskiya, and on the one hand, physical effort to purify ourselves, and two, invoke Allah to guide us, then this will end up in khashya, and we'll get rid of taha, yani insanu lati taha, tughyan. Does that make sense? So here you see once again that these stories of old always share with us what we are in need of, of today. And when you read the Qur'an like this, you will understand it's not a story of old. And strangely so, a lot of Muslims, and that's the last thing I want to say for now, have that impression. Like the people who would say, Asatirul Awaleen. These are the stories of the people of before. What can I do with it? Well, it's actually very actual. It's talking about you, about me, about the community, about the future, about ways to get rid of yani, yourself and to change and be transformed. So in very brief, had a look at four ayat. And they can transform a world. And if not the entire world, at least yours. It is just about how much do you want to do teskiya? How much do you ask for guidance and beg for it? So that you may fear Allah and get rid of transgression. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala sayyidina wa habibina wa qudwatina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.